Good afternoon and welcome to the second session of our day today. Today's sessions are all about dialysis and transplants. So let's get ready for a great afternoon of learning and engaging with the kidney community. You are tuned into our session titled Itchy Skin, which is sometimes known as the, by the medical term, pruritus, uh, weight gain and restless leg syndrome, managing dialysis side effects. Over the next hour, we'll be discussing some of the most common dialysis side effects and self-management strategies. There will also be time for a live question and answer segment during the last 15 minutes of our session today. If you would like to ask our speakers a question, please submit using the chat box next to the video live stream. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, before formally introducing myself and our speakers, I would also like to thank our sponsor, Satellite Healthcare. And without further ado, let's get started with some introductions. As for me, my name is Eric Weinhandel. I am an epidemiologist uh, who actually does work at Satellite Healthcare. I've been involved in kidney disease research and dialysis research for about 20 years or so. And with that, we'll move on to our uh, panel speakers today. Our first speaker today is Dr. Cheyenne Shirazian. Dr. Shirazian received his undergraduate and medical degrees from Brown University and completed his internal medicine residency and nephrology fellowship at the Columbia University Irving Medical Center. He is currently an associate professor of medicine in nephrology and the director of home dialysis at Columbia University. His research interests include testing and implementing interventions to improve the quality of life and self-care in patients with chronic kidney disease and ESKD. Dr. Shirazian has also been an investigator on several studies that have examined the treatment of CKD-associated pruritus in patients with kidney failure. As a nephrologist, our second speaker, Dr. Maria Camilla Bermudez, is passionate about home dialysis modalities. She is an associate professor of medicine at Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine and the associate program director of the Nephrology Fellowship at Geisinger Medical Center. Dr. Bermudez's uh, area of work focuses on advancing the care of patients requiring dialysis by promoting home therapies, education, as well as empowering patients and healthcare professionals. And third, rounding out our speakers today is Dr. Rachel Perlman. Dr. Perlman attended the Bryn Mawr College and then received her med medical degree from the University of Chicago Prisker School of Medicine. She did her internal medicine residency and nephrology fellowship at the University of Michigan, where she currently works. As a nephrologist, Dr. Perlman enjoys taking care of dialysis patients, especially those on home therapies. In addition to her clinical work in nephrology, Dr. Perlman teaches at the University of Michigan Medical School and serves as an associate program director for the Internal Medicine Residency Program and has published articles on dialysis and anemia as they relate to chronic kidney disease. So as you can see, we have a great lineup of speakers today. So let's get started with the discussion and the many questions that will surely come afterward. Um, with that, I will immediately turn this over to Dr. Shirazia, um, who will be presenting some additional information about pruritus today. So please care, continue. Okay. So thank you, Eric, for the really nice introduction. And I'd like to thank the American Kidney Fund for inviting me to speak today. So my topic is itchy skin or pruritus, uh, specifically for patients with chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease. Next slide, please. So today we're gonna to talk about what is chronic kidney disease associated pruritus or itchy skin. We're gonna define it. Uh, then we're gonna talk about how I will know if I have itchy skin. So, so what are the signs? We're gonna talk about some of the causes of itchy skin and what other health problems can cause itchy skin, specifically kidney problems that can cause it. We're gonna talk about how itchy skin is treated and then we're going to talk about, you know, the important thing, treatment. What should I do if I have itchy skin? Next slide, please. So let's start with the definition. So itchy skin, it's known in the medical community as chronic kidney disease-associated pruritus. And it is itchy skin in patients with advanced chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease. And in this population, because itching is so common, anyone with itchy skin is considered to have chronic kidney disease associated pruritus unless there's a clear alternative explanation like a comorbid skin or liver condition. Now the itchy skin is not a disease itself but rather a symptom of the underlying problem which in this case is advanced chronic kidney disease. Symptoms of itchy skin can be acute that is they can last for less than six weeks 
or they can be chronic, which means they last for more than six weeks. Next slide, please. Um, itchy skin can, as I said, can be caused by a skin disease or other systemic diseases like liver disease or kidney disease. Um, and it can also be caused by hematologic problems. And I'll get into this in the next slide, but itchy skin is very common. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a figure from a large prospective study of dialysis patients called the DOPS database. And we get an idea of how common itchy skin is for patients on dialysis. So for patients on dialysis, approximately 68% have any degree of itch. And approximately 35% have at least moderate itchy skin. So it's very prevalent for patients on dialysis. It's very common for these patients to have itchy skin. Next slide, please. So how will you know if you have itchy skin? You know, it kind of presents differently in everyone, and that is differently in terms of how it feels, how intense it is, and when patients get it. Um, it often feels like an uncomfortable prickling or crawling under your skin, and it may be constant. That is, it may always be there, or it may come and go. It, it can also create this urge to scratch, but it's not necessarily relieved by scratching, and you should try to avoid scratching because that could cause complications. Um, you can often see these patches of skin that are itchy, raw, or dry, or different in color than your usual skin tone. Um, and But often you'll see nothing with chronic kidney disease-associated paritis. You just have the itching. There's no associated skin manifestation. The itching can happen at any time, but it may be worse at, at night, which can cause poor sleep in hot weather or when you feel like you're under stress. Next slide, please. Okay, so these are nice uh, pictures from a review from Kidney International in, in 2015. And you can see some of the skin manifestations of chronic kidney disease associated paritis. Because of the itching, you can see these scratch marks on the lower legs. You can see these nodules that you see in the middle on the forearms called perigo nodularis, or you can see these deep scars and perigo nodules that you see on the shoulders of this, this female patient on the right. And again, you may see itching complications like you see in these pictures, but you also may see nothing. You may just have itchy skin, and you more commonly will not see much on skin exam. Next slide, please. Okay, so what causes chronic kidney disease-associated pruritus? What causes the itch itchy skin? That's the million-dollar question. We really don't fully understand what causes the itching in patients with advanced chronic kidney disease. Um, some theories are that it's from under-dialysis, that is, patients not receiving enough dialysis. It, it also is thought to be related to long-term inflammation or, or swelling or the immune system being overactive in your body. Um, there's thought to be a component of it that is related to dry skin, um, and, and that is often caused by the loss of sweat glands, which is common in patients on dialysis. Um, however, it is separate from dry skin because treating dry skin in and of itself does not completely um, resolve itching in patients with chronic kidney disease-associated paritis. It's been thought to be related to high levels of phosphorus, uh, high levels of parathyroid hormone. Uh, deposition of toxins like magnesium and aluminum in the skin. Um, it is also thought to be related to an imbalance of the opioid system in your body, which I'll get into when we talk about treatment. Um, it is in, there's really many different causes of paritis in patients with kidney disease, and it's important to learn, work with your doctor to learn what might be causing itchy skin in you. Next slide, please. Um, so. Besides being a nuisance, uh, itchy skin can also cause some serious health problems. It can cause poor sleep quality. It's been linked to depression. Um, scratching can cause superimposed complications. It can make the itching worse. It can cause cut marks on your body. It can also lead to itching, um, to bleeding and infection in the areas that you scratch. Next slide, please. You know, one thing that I commonly come across is that patients are suffering with chronic kidney associated paritis, yet they're really not informing their doctors of this problem. Now, this is a nice figure, again, from that international prospective study of dialysis patients, 
where patients with that were nearly always or always bothered by itchy skin were, were asked who they report these symptoms to. And in 33% of cases, they reported these symptoms to no one. And in only 26% of cases did they report these symptoms to their nephrologist. So despite being bothered by itchy skin, they were reporting it to no one. And because of that, they, they could not get treatment. Next slide, please. Um, along those lines, itchy skin is underreported. Many patients don't realize that the itchiness is a symptom of kidney disease. They don't think to share this with their healthcare team. Um, the doctors tend to underdiagnose this condition. Um, and so if you're feeling itchy skin, it's really important that you talk to your doctor um, and to ask them about treatments and to talk about treatments that have worked and what have not what has not worked in the past. And as I'll get into, there are options to treat itchy skin. Next slide, please. Okay, you see here in the figure some of the options that we use to treat itchy skin. You know, you should make sure that you're getting the right amount, amount of dialysis. Um, you may try an antihistamine, although the efficacy is, is poor, and I'll get into that. Uh, if you have dry skin, you should try to, to try to treat that with emollient or hydrating creams. Um, you should follow a kidney diet. That's very important. Make sure your phosphorus levels are in goal. Um, and you should check your blood work and work with your doctor again to make sure your calcium, phosphorus, and parathyroid hormone levels are in goal. Next slide, please. Um, again, if you have itchy skin, it's important that you talk with a member of your dialysis care team and ask about treatment. Uh, you should take any medications that are prescribed to you. As we talked about, you should follow that kidney diet and make sure your phosphorus levels are under control. And then in terms of prevention, you know, if there's certain laundry detergents that are, are causing itchiness or that are not for sensitive skin, you should switch to those that are for sensitive skin. You should treat dry skin. You should lose lotion or emollient creams to soften your skin um, and apply it uh, very liberally twice a day. After you shower and dry off, you should, you should apply it. Uh, try not to bathe in hot water, but use more warm or cooler water for baths when you can use a humidifier. And again, avoid scratching because that can lead to complications. Next slide, please. And so if you do those conservative measures and you still have itching, that's where you need to talk to your doctor and ask about medications used to treat itching. Now, some of the medications that have been used have been antihistamines, um, and that's commonly used. It's easy to get. However, there's really not great data on the efficacy of these medications. That is, they, they don't work too well for this problem. And they can have side effects like making you too sleepy. Um, gabapentin is a medication that's prescribed, and it does have some data that shows that it works. However, there, are, there can be serious side effects with these medicines. Um, they can make you dizzy, drowsy. Um, you can be more likely to fall or be confused with this medicine. So you have to be careful with gabapentin. There is some data with steroids, but again, these medications have really bad side effects um, and it particularly can put you at a higher risk of infection. Next slide, please. So that, put, that brings us to the new kid on the block. The FDA actually approved a new medication for treating moderate to severe itchy skin called diphelicephalin. Um, and this medication is actually added to your dialysis treatment at the end. Uh, it, it is not recommended for patients on peritoneal dialysis, but for patients on hemodialysis. And studies have shown that it does improve itch compared to placebo, and it also can improve your quality of life and sleep. There are side effects to this medication, and they include a higher risk of diarrhea, dizziness, and falls. So you should ask your doctor if you're a candidate for this med. Next slide, please. Okay, so in summary, itchy skin is medically known as chronic kidney disease-associated pruritus. It looks different in everyone, um, and so it can happen at any time in relation to dialysis. It's a stressful condition, and it's common in patients on dialysis, and it can cause poor quality of life. It can cause poor sleep, and it can ultimately lead to depression. Patients often don't report this condition to their doctors. It's underreported uh, to their healthcare teams in general. They don't report it. And so it's really important that if you have this condition, you tell your, your healthcare team about it. Um, healthcare providers have underestimated how, how common it is and how impactful it is, and that's led to undertreatment. So it's really important that you advocate for yourself about this condition and getting treatment. 
And treatment should involve treating dry skin and talking with your healthcare team about what options may work best for you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate all of that excellent information. If I could ask you just a few quick questions before we transition to our next speaker. I know we'll have time for Q&A at the end, but I'd like to ask a few while they're fresh in mind right now. Um, first of all, you talked a lot about um, speaking of a patient in, you know, who's experiencing itching, talking to their healthcare team. Um, my question for you is, itching sounds like something that's a symptom that I might take to my primary care doctor, but, but you're also telling me that this itching is often related to kidney disease. So if I'm a patient who's experiencing this problem, where should I start? Should I talk with my nephrologist or should I talk to my primary care doctor? Who do you think is best? Yeah, I mean, I think that really, you know, especially if you're on dialysis, you should be talking to your nephrologist because, you know, often nephrologists act as primary care um, doctors for their patients on dialysis, and they understand what conditions can be related to the kidney disease. And in this case, I don't think the, the primary care doctor will know but, you know, enough about CKDAP to be able to treat it effectively and to know that it's it's the kidney problem that's actually causing the itching. So I would go to your nephrologist first, especially if you have advanced chronic kidney disease or end-stage kidney disease. Okay. Well, that's very helpful. Um, another question for you, and we did have a few audience questions in particular about itching possibly occurring on the scalp. So maybe you could address whether pruritus can manifest as an itch on your scalp. But just generally speaking, where do you see patients experiencing on their body itching the most? Is it back, legs, belly? Yeah. You know, uh, the, the clinical profile of chronic kidney disease-associated pruritus is really highly variable, and it can happen really anywhere on the body. Um, it, it's generally symmetric, you know, it, it's happening on the both sides of the body, um, together. Uh, if it is unilateral, you, you can see it on the face, most often on the face, shunt arm and back. So uh, I would say okay. those are the most common places you see it can happen anywhere. Okay. That's good to know. And then one last question for you right now, and that is, um, Hey, there's a lot of different options, and some of them are definitely creams and other, other over-the-counter sorts of options that people could use. Um, if you're helping a patient address their pruritus or itching, how long do you give each option before you say, I think we're not achieving any success, it's time to move on to the next thing? Is it a week or three weeks or a month? I think I think you hit, you hit the nail on the head. I usually give it about two to four weeks, you know, for, for it to work. Um, by that point, there should be some improvement. So, so around that time frame, about about a month for it to work maximum. Okay, thanks. Um, so we're going to move on here to keep the pace moving. So thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, if, if you're just joining us today, thank you for being here and being a part of Kidney Action Week. You're tuned into our itchy skin, weight gain, and restless leg syndrome managing dialysis side effects live session. We will have a Q and A further along at the end of our time today, but you don't have to wait to ask your questions. Please continue to put them into the chat box on the Kidney Action Week platform. I'm looking at these questions as we go and trying to incorporate them into the Q&A. Um, we're going to move on to our next presenter today. Um, another common side effect of dialysis is weight gain. And weight gain can come in a variety of different forms from um, fat tissue to volume or water. Um, so I'll transition over to Dr. Bermudez, who will speak more about weight gain associated with dialysis and how to work with your nephrologist and broader healthcare team to reduce this side effect. Thank you so much. So welcome to our session, and I want to thank the American Kidney Fund for this invitation. It's truly an honor. So um, I have been given the task uh, to talk about weight gain uh, in patients undergoing dialysis, which, as Eric said, is going to be a common event uh, associated with this more advanced stage of kidney disease. Uh, next slide, slide, please. So when we gain weight, this could be a reflection of either accumulation of water or fluid retention, but it can also be increase in the amount of fat or muscle mass. Depending on which one it is, you're going to see the scale change either very quickly, you are going to see a fluctuation in your weight within 24 hour, hours from one pound to many more pounds when it is fluid retention. But if the weight is increased because of increased fat or muscle mass, that usually is going to take 
few weeks to several months for that to be reflected on the scale. Check, check in your weight every morning before breakfast, um, after going to the bathroom at the same time without clothing is going to give you a more accurate measurement of how your weight is on a day-to-day -day basis. And it will help you determine which type of uh, weight gain you're dealing with. On our next slide, um, I would like to um, show the, the talk. I'm going to be uh, discussing the, the role of the kidneys in maintaining our water balance. We are then going to talk about what signs and symptoms can help you determine if you are retaining fluid, what are the risks of accumulating too much water in your body, and most importantly, how we can prevent these and how we treat it uh, with dialysis or medications. Our next slide, please. So our kidneys are going to be the main players helping us maintain fluid balance. As we can see in this graph, uh, what comes in should come out. So ideally, it should be the same amount. The water that comes into the body is primarily what we drink, but also certain foods that melt into water. If something melts, it's water. So all of that is going to account for the intake. And the output, as you can see, is primarily by the urine, which is going to be produced by the kidneys. We lose a little bit of water through our stools, probably no more than 100 cc's a day if it's a normal bowel movement. And of course, we lose water through sweat. Next slide, please. So there are signs and symptoms that will help you recognize if you are accumulating water. Uh, signs that are helpful would be, as I explained before, if you notice an increase in weight that is rapid, that it happens within a day or two, that is more likely going to be water fluid. If you notice that your blood pressure is increasing, I will touch a little more in, on this uh, topic, it's usually a reflection of water retention. Over time, it can also cause heart damage. What symptoms can I experience if, if I'm retaining water? There's a variety of symptoms. Some patients experience headaches. They may have blurred vision. If, for example, the uh, accumulation of water is now affecting our brain or even the back of our eyes. It's not uncommon that we may go to the eye doctor and they may actually notice that it's increased in the water content. There could be low energy and what we call edema, which is swelling, which could happen in our extremities, in our face, in our abdomen. It is a symptom, but it's also a sign. If you press gently your fingers on a swollen area and the skin remains uh, with a little dip or indentation, indentation for five to 15 seconds, that is usually a reflection of water accumulation. We call that pitting edema. There could be travel breathing. These may be more uh, pronounced when the patients go to bed or are lying flat. This is because of gravity. If water is now reaching our lungs, then it's going to be harder to breathe. Uh, next slide, please. So here on this uh, video, um, we can see what is the connection between uh, drinking excessive amount of water and what that can do to our blood pressure. So the more water we drink and we accumulate, our blood pressure is going to go higher. This will then require that your dialysis will be a little more intense in the, set, in the setting that it may require more time. You may be advised to come an extra day in order to do it in a safe manner. Next slide, please. This is a great tool uh, that is um, available online. This is from a, a site called homedialysis.org. Uh, I highly encourage all my patients to, to practice with this. Uh, as you can see here, this is a calculator that would, would, would individualize how safe it is to remove the amount of fluid that you may need to removed during a particular dialysis treatment. If you happen to have heart problems, your treatments need to be gentler in order to avoid complications. So the recommendation is to try to eliminate or avoid increasing too much water weight. Therefore, your treatments are going to be gentler, perhaps not as longer, and you're going to feel better. Next slide, please. This 
represents what would happen to our heart when we allow our body to have excess of water. So imagine if your heart is a balloon and imagine you're inflating your balloon, exceeding the capacity of the balloon. What will happen is the walls of the balloon will, th will, will thin and over time by in super inflating, hyper inflating and deinflating during dialysis, the walls of that balloon or your heart will become a little stiffer and it will lose the capacity to dilate and contract and over time your heart can be damaged. Next slide, please. So how do we prevent excess of fluid or water retention? So the, the main things we can do is to limit your fluid intake. Your nephrologist will help you determine how much fluid is safe for you. This is gonna vary per patient. Some patients will continue to make significant amount of urine. Some patients may do more frequent dialysis such as home dialysis. Therefore, they might have a more liberal uh, ability to take more fluid. So it will be individualized and it will vary per patient. You wanna cut back on salt intake. When we have increase in salt intake that will stimulate your thirst. So it will encourage you to drink more water. It also, salt retains water. You want to track your weight every day as I explained before. You want to stick as much as possible to your dialysis schedule. You may consider dialysis at home, which is more frequent and more gentle. And I'll represent how that looks like in a couple of slides. If you still make urine and as per your nephrologist recommendation, you may benefit from diuretics. These are medications or water pills that will stimulate your kidneys to increase the amount of uh, urine production. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, uh, some patients in advanced stages of, of uh, kidney disease will continue to make significant amount of urine. They may benefit tremendously from the intake of diuretics uh, for stimulation of urine production. Next slide. So how much fluid is removed by dialysis? This slide represents mostly in-center dialysis. So let me start with a very important uh, concept that is called dry weight. So dry weight is when you don't have excess of fluid in your body. So it's really your ideal weight. In other words, you don't have swelling, you are breathing okay, your blood pressure is controlled. That is again, your target or dry weight. So for example, if your dry weight is 70 kilograms and you go on the weekend, which is two days without dialysis, and you happen to you know, have your meals and drink your water, you may gain up to say three kilos. Therefore, when you go to your next dialysis, they're going to weigh you. The excess of fluid was three kilos, you know, added to your dry weight, which was 70, that makes it 73 your dialysis will try to remove three kilograms, and then the idea is to take you back to your dry weight. Next slide. This slide represents the difference between the different types of dialysis and how they would handle a removal of fluid. So in the first uh, upper portion of the slide, we see the two schedules of in-center dialysis. On the first one is the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and on the right, you have the Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Please notice that the days you don't have dialysis, you're going to have an increase in your weight uh, that especially on the two day gap, is gonna make it a little more challenging for the first dialysis of the week to remove your uh, water uh, weight gain. On home therapies, because this happens more frequently, in the case of peritoneal dialysis, it will be every day or every night, depending on your regimen. You're gonna have a steady fluid removal. This is gonna make it more gentle, more tolerated, and at most times, you're gonna be close to your dry weight. And that also goes for home hemodialysis, which usually will be performed between four to seven days a week. And again, it will eliminate the fluctuation in weight that might happen on those days when you do not have fluid removal because you didn't have a dialysis treatment. On home therapies, patients tend to recuperate faster after each treatment, and it's very much believed that this is because there's less fluid to be removed, so it is more 
tolerated with our heart and the rest of our organs. Next slide. So take home points. Um, you want to be as close as to, uh, as to your dry weight as much as possible. So watch your salt and fluid intake in close cooperation uh, with your nephrologist and your dietitian to understand how much fluid you should be able to drink to maintain this balance. You want to track your weight at home, as I explained earlier, ideally every day at the same time in the morning. Um, if you still make urine, I would adhere to the diuretic regimen prescribed by your nephrologist, and you want to adhere to dialysis regimen as much as possible and consider a home therapy that is going to be more gentle um, and you know, will make you feel better in this regard. This is going to allow you to have a healthier heart, uh, staying close to your dry weight and will help control your blood pressure better. You're going to have gentler treatment and you're going to feel better overall. Next slide. So my last uh, slide um, is regarding the possibility of gaining fat weight, which is very much associated with peritoneal dialysis and not so much with hemodialysis. For, for those not very familiar with peritoneal dialysis, this is a type of home dialysis that is performed without um, blood outside the body, without needles. Basically, the way this works is a cleaning solution that we call dialysate, which we can see the representation on the three colors, yellow, green, and red. It's going to be put into the abdominal cavity of the patient. This is going to be the cleaning solution, uh, and it's basically sugar. So depending on how much sugar the solution has, it's going to stimulate water removal, either more gentle to a little more aggressive. In other words, if I have to remove more fluid, I want to give more sugar content because sugar is going to really carry that water out of the body. So Yellow is the gentler, less sugar. Green is in the middle, and red would be the one that would help you uh, stimulate more fluid, fluid removal, but also will have more sugar content. Most patients that start peritoneal dialysis have some um, weight gain in the first year, but it doesn't happen to all patients. And the way to prevent this and to take control is to work very closely with your nephrologist and with your dietitian, and very much so by limiting how much water and salt content you take and eliminating water accumulation is going to allow for you to have gentler dialysis treatments. Therefore, you're going to need less exposure to sugar content and have gentler treatments. Next slide. But uh, I greatly appreciate your presentation, Dr. Bermudez. Actually, I have a few questions for you. I know the time is flying here today, but I got to ask a few things. Okay, so first of all, let me ask one for those people who are um, currently doing in-center dialysis. Um, a lot of people report feeling extremely thirsty at the end of treatment. Um, but of course, at the end of treatment, you've got 48 hours or more until your next treatment. What advice would you give to people who are feeling very thirsty at the end of an in-center treatment uh, to try and sort of not get that fluid intake started again? So there's a lot of tips uh, that I've learned from a renal dietitian. So the number one tip is to try to avoid salt content in the diet. Ideally, less than 10% um, you know, of salt in the diet. The least salt you take, the less thirsty you're going to feel. Um, you can also, for example, freeze uh, your favorite beverage, and that way it will last longer during the day. Frozen grapes, for example, are a nice uh, snack that can help um, um, minimize the, the desire to be drinking water. Um, there, there are more things that your renal dietitian will help you, um, you know, understand that you can actually limit how much water uh, you drink. So. Yeah. All right, great. That's a very helpful information. Um, a different one for another modality, and that is for our patients who are on peritoneal dialysis or maybe are, are thinking about peritoneal dialysis. Um, you know, a lot of times people start PD and their kidneys are still working a bit. And so they may be producing urine on a daily basis. Um, but let's say that, you know, you've got a person who's been doing really well on PD. 
Um, and the patient starts to notice that they're gaining weight more and maybe not removing fluid quite as much as they were. Maybe they've stopped urinating. Maybe they just feel like they're gaining weight on a weekly basis. Um, what would you advise to those patients to, to when to discuss with their team, what to discuss, what to bring up? Eric, very important. And I think communicating with your team is pivotal. Um, and, you know, each patient is going to be different. Um, peritoneal dialysis may be a, a therapy that could be less, uh, a, a, you know, a therapy that patients can do for more than several years. But for some patients, that unfortunately may not be the case. And it may be that it's time to consider other forms of dialysis, such as home hemodialysis, for example. Before even getting into that, your team will help you troubleshoot and think about what else can be done, whether it is increasing the dose of your diuretics or work closer with your dietitian. Again, if you're retaining less water and salt, you know, sometimes that has a lot to do with that bloating sensation or, you know, the need to require the red bags more, which is giving you exposure to more, sh more sugar. And of course, working with your dietitian to limit your caloric intake, uh, increase your exercise routine. Uh, there's a lot of things that can be done to, to minimize um, this weight gain. All right. Well, thank you very much. I better keep it moving because I got the clock ticking here. So let's move on to our last prepared presentation today. So we have some time for questions and answers at the end. Uh, Dr. Perlman has some exciting information to share with all of us today about restless leg syndrome, which is yet another very common symptom that our dialysis population experiences. Uh, Dr. Perlman, carry on. Hi, thank you very much. And I'm really pleased to be here with you and everybody else who's tuned in during Kidney Action Week. So thanks very much for that. Uh, first slide, please. What is restless leg syndrome? That's what I'm going to talk about today. And I'd really like to start by defining what it feels like, because this is a, a symptom or a syndrome that goes along with dialysis and other problems. But sometimes people wonder if they have it. So what is what does it feel like? Restless leg syndrome is often described as a tremendous and often very unpleasant urge to move your legs. This happens especially at night or at any other time that you're sitting still for a long time, like a long car ride. It can happen during sleep and it can even wake you up when you're asleep. It can make falling asleep difficult and it can make uh, staying asleep hard too. Some people don't describe it as much as a movement, but also a sense of crawling or throbbing or aching or itching or a burning feeling. And they usually describe that as a sense on the inside of their body, not on their skin. And this is usually different from cramps or numbness. And when uh, doctors think about it, we categorize it both as a sleep disorder and as a movement disorder. Next slide, please. This is a really common problem, depending on uh, what survey you look at, up to one in seven adults in the US has this, and this is definitely more common for people who are on dialysis. It can come and go in intensity over time, and we call it restless legs, which is the most common, but it can also affect the arms and the even the trunk part of the body. And it can be significant because it can make falling asleep difficult. It can lead to being tired during the day, and that's associated with depression and decreased quality of life. Next slide, please. So what causes restless legs? This is not 100% understood. Sometimes it's genetic. It's likely related to aspects of the nervous system. Iron deficiency, especially in specific cells of the nervous system, is thought to be a cause. And there's also alterations in neurotransmitters, which are how cells of the nervous system communicate. And then it's also associated with changes in blood flow to the legs, which is unfortunately common for people on dialysis. Next slide, please. Who gets restless legs? So it's more common as we get older. Women are more likely to be affected and symptoms sometimes start during pregnancy. Next slide, please. It's also associated with several other medical conditions and people with these are, are more likely to have restless legs. So kidney disease and kidney failure for sure. Also iron deficiency, neuropathy, 
spinal cord disease, multiple sclerosis, and sleep apnea. And although now not talking about disease, but it can also be associated with consuming alcohol, nicotine, and caffeine. Next slide, please. So if you're wondering whether you have restless leg syndrome, there isn't a specific test for this. The diagnosis is based on your symptoms, that strong and overwhelming urge to move your legs. Um, this usually starts when you're at rest. Um, it's relieved at least partially or um, temporarily by movement, and it usually gets worse in the evening and at night. Importantly, these symptoms aren't caused by another medical or emotional or psychiatric condition. And these, these symptoms can be classified as intermittent, which is less than twice a week, or chronic persistent, which is at least twice a week. And that matters for how you might be treated for it. Next slide, please. In terms of treatment, I want to start with self-management because self-care and lifestyle are, are really important for feeling better when you have this condition. For many people, avoiding or decreasing the use of alcohol, nicotine, and caffeine can be helpful. Establishing a regular sleep pattern is really important. And this can be a vicious cycle because restless legs can get worse when you aren't sleeping well. And then when it's worse, it can be harder to sleep. And so trying really hard to stay in a, in a healthy sleep pattern is important. Moderate regular exercise, including both aerobic exercise like walking or, or more vigorous if you prefer, and leg stretching can be really important. And massaging the legs a lot of people find very useful. Next slide, please. Other things that are often useful are warm baths, um, heating pads, although I can't say heating pads without saying be so careful not to fall asleep with a heating pad because of the potential for burns. Uh, some people find ice packs more, more beneficial than heat. Activities that stimulate your brain, which are sometimes called mental alerting activities like games or crossword puzzles, since symptoms sometimes come on when people are bored. Um, compression stockings, and these can be bought over the counter or online. But if you're not sure about sizing for your leg, you can get measured for, for the proper fit for these. And sometimes if you have a prescription, your insurance will cover them. Compression socks are safe for many, many people, but it's definitely worth talking to your uh, healthcare provider about just in case there's a reason that you shouldn't use them. And then less commonly, but also used are uh, foot wraps, especially designed for people with restless legs or vibration pads to the back of the legs. Next slide, please. It's also important to make sure there's not another sleep problem like sleep apnea, because if there is, that can be treated and that'll help sleep. Um, and sometimes medications that you're taking can make this worse, including both over-the-counter and prescription medications like cold medications, antidepressants, antipsychotics, and medication to help with nausea. So definitely worth talking to your healthcare provider about what medication you're already taking. Then there are medical treatments on top of the, the lifestyle interventions, and the most commonly used is iron. And no, I don't recommend going out and just buying a bottle of iron tablets because this should be based on your individual need following a blood test of iron levels. But it's very common to get iron infusions as part of your dialysis therapy. Um, and peritoneal dialysis units are, are very often used to giving iron infusions also. Medications that increase dopamine in the brain, which are also used to treat Parkinson disease, are, are used for restless legs. And so this includes carbidopa, levodopa, which is really for occasional use. And other medications such as ropinerol and primlopexol, which are used every day and the, the um, dose can be adjusted based on your need. There's a phenomenon that I want to mention called augmentation, and it's when people have been taking these medications that affect dopamine level for a, a long time, and their symptoms come back, and they feel even worse than they were before. Happily, this only happens in a small percent of people, but it, it's a real phenomenon. And so if you think it's happening to you, it's not in your imagination. You should definitely talk to your healthcare provider because there are things that you can do about it. 
um, medications that are used to treat seizures are also sometimes used, um, specifically gabapentin. And for this, I think it's really important that it's prescribed either by your kidney doctor or with the input of your kidney doctor, because this needs to be dose adjusted for people who are on dialysis. Doctors really try to avoid opioid pain relievers and muscle relaxants because of the side effects that go along with them and the potential for dependence. And so those were used more historically, but are, are rarely used now. And then this isn't exactly a medication, but on the list of things that are prescribed, sometimes getting more dialysis helps, which can feel ironic when restless legs is making it hard to sit through your dialysis treatment, but more dialysis is sometimes very useful. In, in helping with the symptoms. And these symptoms often get significantly better or go away when people are able to get a kidney transplant. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, if this is a symptom that's bothering you, talk about it because there are things that you can do. And we definitely need more research, both in terms of understanding better what causes restless legs and the best ways to treat it, including drug and non-drug therapies. Thanks a lot, Eric. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, excellent presentation. I know it's uh, an important problem that many patients experience and, um, and many people without kidney failure experience it too. So it's not unfamiliar. Um, one question um, that already came in from the group is just, um, if I'm a person who you know maybe is not interested in using medications, at least as a first attempt at dealing with this problem, um, what would you suggest are the best ways to try addressing restless leg syndrome? So I, I really agree with and support using um, lifestyle modification and self-care techniques as a, as a first line because the side effects are so much less than medications. And so in terms of what I really hear is useful, stretching, absolutely, getting regular exercise, thinking about doing that stretching before bed, especially. Um, five or 10 minutes a night can make a big difference and trying to get a good night's sleep. And then everything else on the list I think is worth trying, but if I could pick two, that's where I would start. Okay, well, that's really helpful. Another question actually is an interesting one that came through in the chat. I wouldn't have thought of this one, but are there um, any over-the-counter drugs that people commonly use or even non-prescription items that are over-the-counter that, that could aggravate restless leg syndrome? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. So medications that people sometimes take for um, allergies and colds like antihistamines can aggravate restless legs. And of course, that doesn't mean that it, it aggravates it for everybody. But if you are taking a cold medication or an allergy pill like Benadryl and you notice your symptoms getting worse, I would I would pay careful attention to that. Um, question I have for you is sort of what role does um, exercise and physical activity here help in? I, one patient actually asked in the chat box, could it make things worse? Um, my question is actually the opposite. Um, does exercise help with um, alleviating you know, the, the symptoms of restless leg occurring when you go to bed? Yeah, so I haven't not heard about exercise making things worse. And so, of course, if you overexert yourself one day, you might be excessively fatigued or strain something. But in general, the, the weight of the evidence supports exercise helping. And both stretching type exercises and more um, moving around exercise, what I call aerobic exercise, but commonly walking or biking if you're able swimming or jogging, but walking is great exercise for people on dialysis. And then for people who can walk, I feel so confident saying that because it, it helps with so many things. And um, exercise really is a useful intervention for people on dialysis, not counting restless legs, but in terms of overall well-being. Yeah, well, I completely agree with you. I mean, I think that there's some there's some themes across all these symptoms that we've discussed today about um, certain aspects of dialysis and aspects of lifestyle that probably address all of these things. I want to bring, uh, with the help of our, our technology people here, uh, bring everybody together.
so we can open this up for Q&A during our last 10 minutes together. Again, um, we are in a session about symptoms related to dialysis, and it is time for our question and answer portion of the segment. So if you haven't typed a question into the chat box, please do so, and I'll continue to monitor them, and we'll try to answer as many as possible. Um, I don't have additional questions at the moment, so I will just start this off myself. Um, Dr. Bermudez, um, I sort of alluded to this actually just a moment ago, but my question for you is this. Um, let's say I'm a person who's uh, dialyzing in center uh, three times a week. You know, I'm getting a little tired of it. I'd really like to cut down, you know, can I get 15 minutes off each treatment doc, please? You know, I just got places to be. I, I'm really not enjoying being here. I mean, what would you say to a person about any of these symptoms? Is it, you know, that it probably won't make any difference if you cut down? Or are you sort of increasing the chances that any of these symptoms are going to show up? What would you say? Eric, thank you for that question. I think it's a very common uh, situation. So the answer is the following. The shorter the treatments, the harder the treatments will be for you. And chances are you're going to feel more tired and it's going to be harder on your heart, and over time, it's not going to be uh, good for your overall health. What we know is that the gentler the treatments are, and by gentler means sometimes more time and more frequent, uh, patients feel better. This is associated with improved quality of life uh, and even improved survival. Uh, as I explained in my talk, you know, if we don't allow our, especially our heart, to accumulate too much fluid at a time. If we're not too aggressive, uh, removing the fluid, if we allow time for that to happen slowly and gently, um, believe me, you are going to feel better. Coding is never going to be the right uh, solution to the symptoms, and it's actually likely going to worsen all the symptoms we talked about today. Um, Dr. Shirazi, and I'd like to ask you a question as well. Toward the end of your presentation today, you talked about a new medication that's available. Um, I think it's a generic name, but it goes by difficult to pronounce, Defelicaphalin. The brand name is Corsuva. Um, I have a feeling, just a guess, that it is possible that a patient could become aware of this drug and actually talk to their nephrologist and find out that the nephrologist doesn't know about the medication because it is pretty new. Um, let's just say that happens. Like I, I tried a few different topical agents and, you know, I want to try this medication that was discussed today, but my nephrologist doesn't know anything about it. Where do I go now? Yeah, you know, that, that's, that's an interesting question. I think that, you know, there's a lot more coming out about this medication. So I would, I would go back to your, your nephrologist and really ask specifically about any new treatment, specifically diphelicephalin, because th there's a lot of emerging data about it. I mean, you can even pull up the New England Journal article that, that was out, you know, about two years ago and show it to your nephrologist and, and you can try to educate your nephrologist. You know, it's very hard when you're on dialysis to seek uh, care from a different nephrologist or to get information from your primary about a nephrologic condition. So I would really just push push your nephrologist and, and your dialysis team to, to look into the medication for you. Okay. Well, that's really helpful information. And, and you make an excellent point. The, um, the, the largest trial that ultimately led to the approval of the medication is published online. And it's easy for anyone to type into Google New England Journal of Medicine, type in the words dialysis and itching, and I'm sure you'll find the result very easily. Um, Dr. Perlman, I would like to ask you a question. Um, a lot of these symptoms, I suspect, are not, I know we've got a session today about dialysis, but I suspect we also have people in the audience who maybe uh, have kidney disease, but yet aren't on dialysis. Um, I have a suspicion that many of these symptoms show up in the CKD clinic too. Um, if you're a person who, you know, is seeing a doctor regularly to have your kidney disease monitored and you're starting to experiencing more and more of these symptoms, whether it's restless leg or itching, um, even weight gain, of course, from fluid, um, what does that sort of tell you as a doctor? What does it tell you as a patient about where your kidney disease is going and, and what sorts of steps you should take as a patient to manage it? Thanks, Eric. That's a good question. Um... Some symptoms reliably show up as people's kidney disease gets worse, but some symptoms like restless leg can be um, 
can be really annoying and troublesome earlier in the course of kidney disease also. So it's not necessarily a sign that your kidney function is getting worse. That being said, um, when people know they have kidney disease and it's being followed, it's usually reasonable to check kidney levels and make sure your GFR hasn't changed much if you're experiencing a worsening of symptoms that can be related to kidney trouble. And everything that I mentioned about lifestyle are, are things that people can do when they don't need dialysis and so are, are applicable to a, a more general population also. Okay. Um, I will keep the merry-go-round of questions going here. I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Bermudez. Uh, you talked a lot about salt intake, and I couldn't agree more. Now I have lots of children, and so I know each corner of the grocery store well and where there's more salt and where there's less salt. Um, let me ask you this. If I am a person who is on dialysis, I go into the grocery store, where are some sections that are friendly for me for sodium and salt content and other sections that I probably ought to try to stay away from? Great question, Eric. And you know, for that, I would very much also encourage all patients to work very closely with the dietitian. They have amazing resources, but as, as more, the more organic, the better. So you wanna go to the fresh food. Uh, you want to stay away from anything that is processed chances are that's going to be very high uh, in, in salt content and potentially phosphorus, which is part of what we were talking about today, uh, say, for example, with the pruritus. Um, so vegetables, fruits, everything, the least processed, the better. Um, that's going to be your best chances, choices. Well, thank you. That's uh, important information. I uh, I always am um, shocked by just how much salt, especially is in the frozen section of the grocery store. It's just remarkable to me how difficult it is to avoid it if you're uh, shopping in that part of the store. Um, thank you to all of our audience uh, and to our panelists today for all of the time that we spent together. We do have a few minutes left here before we wrap up today's session, so I want to leave everyone with some key takeaways. So I'm going to have each of our speakers share their final thoughts, um, maybe two takeaways. Uh, one, one thing to know, one thing that you can do as a patient, I, if you would like to know the audience about pruritus or weight gain, restless leg syndrome. So we'll just sort of go around the block here. Uh, starting with you, Dr. Shrazian, what are some final takeaways for our audience today? Okay, so the final takeaway is that chronic kidney disease associated pruritus is a common condition and it's treatable. And there are newer, newer, newer and newer medications to treat this condition. And in terms of what patients should do, I think really you, you have to advocate for yourself. If you have this condition or you think you have this condition, you should ask your physician about it or ask your healthcare team and have them look into treatment options for you um, because you really are not going to improve unless you advocate for yourself with this condition. Excellent advice. Uh, Dr. Perlman? Restless leg is probably underdiagnosed in dialysis units and in dialysis patients. It's a, it's a common problem. And if you're experiencing it and it's bothering you, don't keep that to yourself. There are treatments both, both that you can do alone at home and that your doctors can prescribe for you. So probably nobody is going to guess that you have restless legs if you don't tell them, unless it's so bad that it's obvious. So Kind of like my colleague just said with puritis, I do recommend advocating for yourself and bringing those symptoms forward so that people know how much they're bothering you. Right, thank you. And Dr. Bermudez, what are your takeaways from today? So weight gain is going to be a very common event, but I encourage you to work very closely with your dietitian and your nephrologist to limit the amount of water weight that you accumulate. The least water weight you accumulate the better you will feel, the gentler your treatment will be. Probably um, your heart will be healthier. And in connection with, with what we learned about peritoneal dialysis and increase of fat weight associated with this modality, um, remember it's very much associated to water weight. If you are able to limit how much water you retain, your peritoneal dialysis will be gentler and you're going to be exposed to less calories from the therapy. So overall, it's going to be um, a good experience for you. Well, thank you very much for all of that. I will just wrap up with my own thoughts here. You know, I think that just about everybody here on our panel has emphasized today that these symptoms are common. 
These are things that many, many dialysis patients experience. And I would venture to say that all, all three of our panelists today would tell you that there isn't a symptom that they haven't seen before. So please, if you're experiencing these symptoms on dialysis, please tell your team, your nephrologist about them because they do want to help you and they have experience more likely than not with dealing with these symptoms. So thank you to everyone today. It's important to uh, always keep awareness of symptoms and not just talk about um, big clinical events like we sometimes do in research. Um, it's time to close out our session. Thank you to the audience for watching and participating in our question and answer segment. We really hope you enjoyed our session today and found it informational. Uh, more Kidney Action Week content is on the agenda. Next up is a mini session that features Quentin Gee as he spends the day with his family at In Center Dialysis. Uh, tune in at 4.50 p.m. Eastern Time or 3.50 p.m. Central to watch. And following our mini session, you will have the opportunity to meet some members of your dialysis care team. Uh, tune in to that live session at 5.15 p.m. Eastern, 4.15 Central. As we conclude this session, you will see a link for a quick survey in green below the video screen. Please take a few minutes to fill it out and tell us how we did. Quality of information today. Your feedback is very useful because Kidney Action Week will be back next year uh, with more information. So for more information on this week and other American Kidney Fund events, follow us on Facebook or send us an email at info at kidneyfund.org and you will be the first to know about other resources like this. Thanks again and have a great day.